Good morning. <laughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. It is so good to see you this morning. Glad that you are here, that you have, have chosen to, to gather up in this place and worship with us at Epworth United Methodist Church. We also want to welcome those who are worshiping with us at home, uh, who have tuned in uh, to Channel 6 or uh, looking at Facebook Live or will be worshiping with us on YouTube. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to you all. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are grateful. Gathered here, we're going to worship. Uh, right, uh, real quick, before we gather, uh, before we begin our worship, a couple of announcements. Uh, I am not Steve. Uh, you'll notice that Steve is up in our sound booth. He's waving at you. We, we've got uh, Sherry and Tim are on vacation this week, so Steve is, is in our sound booth. Um, I've instructed him, he's to, he's to make me sound taller. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's going to work or not, uh, but that, that's his marching orders. We are, I'm, so, I'm so thankful for Steve and, and uh, the way that he serves uh, our congregation. He does so many things. Uh, if, you, if you get a chance and you haven't thanked him uh, for all that he does, thank him uh, for all that he does when you get the opportunity. Um, a couple of weeks ago... <clears throat> Uh, Jeannie Johnson and Pam Cooper and I went to Oklahoma City for annual conference. It's the first time we've had uh, the opportunity to gather in person uh, with other United Methodist folks from around the state for our annual conference. We've, we've, been, we've been isolated for a couple of years and have missed it. Uh, it was a great conference. There wasn't a whole lot of business uh, that uh, was taking place. We've got another conference conference scheduled uh, later this fall uh, that will be taking up some business items. Uh, but we were able to gather together. We were able to, to reconnect with folks from across the, the conference that we've been missing uh, for a few years. Uh, and so it was really, really good. I wanted to share just a couple of things uh, about uh, the conference. This, these are, I'm, I'm paraphrasing uh, these words, but these are the observations from Pam and, and Jeannie. Uh, they want you to know that the United Methodist Church is, is still alive and thriving, uh, that there a lot of good things going on. There's a lot of things happening and a lot of opportunities to serve God and to see God at work in the lives of people in the United Methodist Church in Oklahoma. And, and we get to be a part of that. And we'll be continuing to, to share some of those stories and to share some of those opportunities with you uh, in the days and weeks and months uh, to come. Uh, but the future uh, is bright uh, and and. Uh, the world needs us. Amen to that. The world needs us. And, and so we've got, we've got opportunities to do, uh, to, to do things in the world that are kingdom kinds of things. And I'm excited about that. And I, I thank Pam and, and I thank Jeannie for, for their time and, and making it to annual conference. We've got um, uh, work to do later this, uh, this year, as I said, uh, but we'll share some of that uh, as we get closer. You'll notice in your bulletin we've got... Um, I think most of you will have these uh, little cards. Uh, today, in, in addition to being Trinity Sunday, today is Peace uh, with Justice Sunday. Um, it's a, sp a special offering day. So I encourage you to be in prayer uh, about um, uh, an over and above uh, kind of gift. Uh, that will be joined with offerings from other people uh, and other congregations in Oklahoma and across the connection uh, to be in ministry uh, to people that are suffering uh, great injustices. Uh, so we have that. Uh, that card is in your bulletin. I also want to remind you, if you haven't done so yet, the little blue cards are in the pew backs in front of you. Take an opportunity, please, to fill those out and drop those in the offering plates. If you're worshiping with us at home, 
Uh, please let us know that you are worshiping with us. Uh, shoot us a, an email. Shoot us a, a, um, a reply on our, on our Facebook feed. Uh, we would love to have you uh, uh, to, to know that you're worshiping with us. Also, want to, want to announce that there is this, this beautiful rose on the altar this morning. This is for Vivian June Calhoun, born June 1st, granddaughter of Steve and Gina, niece of Uncle Clint. So we celebrate with them uh, this day at that, that joy of that new birth. I think I've covered everything. Steve, anything? No. So, uh, Steve will shut me down uh, when he feels like I need to be shut down. You're shut down. <laughs> he does not need any encouragement from you. <laughs> let, us, let us prepare our hearts. Let us prepare our minds. We have gathered together. It is time to worship. If you will please sing and join me in singing our hymn of praise, Come Thou Almighty King. to join us in our call to worship. The bold print uh, is your part. You'll find it in your bulletin or on the screen. From the very whisper of creation, God poured forth love. Praise God for the blessings of love. In the fullness of time, God sent Jesus as a revelation of God's own self. When we thought all hope was lost, God offered the Holy Spirit to heal and to guide us. Praise the Holy Spirit for guidance and inspiration. For the trinity of understanding, we sing praise. Blessings, honor, power, and majesty to God forevermore. Amen. Amen. We will remain standing for our songs of praise and worship this morning. turns from darkness to light. Anytime temptation comes and someone stands to fight. Anytime somebody lives to serve and not be served. I know, I know.
Amen. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Take our reading this morning from the third chapter of the gospel according to John's very familiar passage to many of us. We're beginning in the very first verse of that chapter. And John writes, There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. And he, Nicodemus, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it is not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? And Jesus answered, I assure you that unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it is not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I've said to you, you must be born anew. God's Spirit blows where it wishes. You hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who's come down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Mm, this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. 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 You may be seated. And as you're having your seats, I invite our youngsters to come to the front. We'll have our time together. <coughs> Good morning, good morning. How's everyone? All right. He got it going on. He's got it going on. Yeah, the rest of y'all a little bit slow on that, all right? Oh, here's one. Here's one. Good morning. How are you? Is there a cow in here, Mr. Jack? Huh? You think there's a cow in here? I don't think there's a cow in here. I don't think there's a cow in here. But we've got... We've got the mystery bag. It feels, it feels empty. There's no, I don't feel anything. Come on up here. It may be paper, but Miss Quinn brought it. Actually, Miss Quinn's mom brought it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, ooh, I feel a little something right here. I feel a little bit of something right here. What do you think? What do you think it is? You think it might be a piece of paper? Yeah, or one of Quinn's toys. One of, me, one of what? I think it might be one of Quinn's toys or... One of Quinn's toys. Let's see what it is. Well, it's not paper. It's not paper. It's not really a toy. You want to guess? No. She's got one right now. It's a passy. Passy. Oh, my God. 
So, so you think Quinn picked this out, or do you think Quinn's mom picked this out? Quinn. Quinn. Quinn? You think Quinn picked this yeah, out? Yeah, because usually if it's passing, the baby. So, so what what do you use this for? What do you use this for? To shut her up. <laughs> you gotta go watch this now. I can have this one back. So, so listen. Why do why do you not just to shut babies up? Why do why do parents give pacifiers or binkies? to babies. You have to help them teeth sometime. It gives them something to chew on. What were you going to say? Give them something to suck on. Give them something to suck on. Um, and, and why is that important? That because if they suck on it, it's like they're trying to... Where are you going? Well, more if they suck on it, they're like trying to get it into their mouth and chew on it. Sometimes, yeah, chew. Help them get their nap. Help them get their nap. Yeah, that's a good thing. So... A lot of times, uh, babies use things like pacifiers uh, when they're uncomfortable. It, it provides some comfort to them, right? It provides comfort. When they're crying, you, put, you, give, them, you give them a pacifier, and, and they stop crying. Not because they have something stuffed in their mouth, but because it's, it's a comforting thing for them, right? And, uh, and, so, and so that's a great gift that we can give a, a baby when they are not, when they're not comfortable, when they're not happy, when they're, when they're upset about something, if they don't feel real good, right? Uh, and, and so this is a great gift that parents can give uh, their children. Uh, we have a gift that helps us get through difficult times in our lives, even as we get older. As old as you are, even as old as some of these folk are out here, we have a great gift that is given to us to help us get through some difficult times in our lives. You know what that gift is called? It's called the Holy Spirit. God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and, and we're, we'll talk a little bit about this. Steve talked about it some last week, but, but God gives us the gift of the Spirit uh, to, to guide us, to lead us, uh, to, to instruct us, to give comfort to us. That's a, big th that's a big part of what the Holy Spirit does, is give comfort to us. So when we're going through difficult times, when we don't know why things are, are confusing or frightening or concerning, we can rely on the Holy Spirit. Even if we don't fully understand, we know that we've got God's Spirit with us, loving us, giving us comfort, and getting us through, yeah. right? The binky gets, gets babies through those difficult times. So now I have one too because <laughs> you said you're not... You, 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 I'll wash it. You can have it. I can have it? I'll, I'll use this. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, all right. So, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great um, uh, item to share with us. Thank you, Quinn and Quinn's mom. Thank you. All right. So, now then, we got we to gotta give out our mystery bag. And... And I've visited with somebody here already that said he didn't think he was ever going to get the mystery bag. Are you going to be here next week? Yes. Yes? It's yours. All right. So, you remember, you remember, everybody will get it. Everybody will get it. We're going to, we're going to, everybody's going to get a chance. You remember the rules, right? I'm going to be the what, What's the rule? It can't be alive. It can't be dead. And at least one adult has to know what it is. All right. Good, good. So, let's pray. We do not need a passy. Yeah, we, I, I don't need a passy? I might. Okay. All right. We give you thanks, God, for giving us wonderful gifts. Sometimes gifts that, that bring great, great joy. Sometimes gifts that just bring comfort. We thank you for the gift of children and for the gift of pacifiers. We especially thank you, God, for the gift of your spirit uh, to be with us, to lead us, to guide us. But sometimes 
to give comfort to us when things aren't uh, going our way, when things don't make sense to us. God, I thank you for all of these children, for all the homes they come from. I thank you, God, for the way that you are growing uh, in them, that you have given them a wonderful gift of curiosity. God, help us to see the world through their eyes. And God, we pray that you will also let the world see them in you and you in them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Good job, Quinn. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I think Quinn would take that binky back. I think Quinn's mama thinks it's got preacher cooties now. <laughs> oh, me. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's pray. God of all grace and mercy, you have called us to gather to this place. You have heard our prayers. We have lifted our voices in song and praise. And God, we have heard a word read. And we ask that you will speak to us in all of those ways. Now, God, I ask that you will pour your spirit out you allow your servant to stand in the shadow of the cross so that the words that I speak and the meditations of all of our hearts are pleasing and acceptable to you O oh God our rock and our redeemer amen amen so today, as I've mentioned already, today is Trinity Sunday. And in, in the, the liturgical life of the church, that is the day every year that the church uh, considers and celebrates the, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And the Holy Trinity is, is, is what is the name that we give uh, the, the three uh, in one nature of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Some, sometimes you might hear folks refer to God uh, in Trinitarian form as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. And on this day, uh, we, 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 when we consider uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, um, you will have people like me say to you some, in some way uh, that the Trinity is, is this thing that, that, we, that we have constructed in the church that, that helps us uh, uh, define the nature, what we believe to be the nature of God. And not only does it help us define that, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity helps us uh, understand and talk about this triune God that we worship. Now, I will tell you that that's not an easy thing to do, to talk about God. I, 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 I attempt to do that every week. Some of you attempt to do that every week in various ways as well. But it, it's not an easy thing to do to talk about God, and particularly in, in this understanding of this three-in-one nature of God. It, it's so difficult. In fact, it took, it took the early church fathers, the, those, those people that gathered together in all the early councils the, the, to frame uh, and articulate uh, our affirmations of faith, our, our, our creedal statement. It took them several hundred years of wrestling together and wrestling with the limitations of language to craft a document, to craft a statement that everyone could agree upon when it's talking about God. And that statement, that document is called the Nicene Creed. We still use it in uh, the church today. 
we're going to say together the Nicene Creed here in a few minutes. It's in, it's in your hymn book if you're curious about what it says. It's also in, in, the, in the bulletin I printed it out for you. It's number 880 in the hymn book if you're curious about what the Nicene Creed says. Other creedal affirmation, other affirmations of faith have grown out of the Nicene Creed. Now, scholars and theologians, preachers and lay people alike have struggled for for 2,000 plus years to articulate a clear and a concise understanding of the Trinity. But as I suggested, it's difficult. Uh, a, a great, uh, a, the great father, St. Augustine, back in the late 4th and early 5th century, uh, began writing about the Trinity. And it took Augustine 20 years and 15 volumes to say what he wanted to say. And he still struggled with it. And ultimately, ultimately, Augustine said... This, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. The Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son. There's only one God. Even even John Wesley Father John, the, 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 the guy that's responsible for this whole movement that became the United Methodist Church, even Father John struggled with it. He, 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 talked, about, he talked about how bringing a candle into a dark room, that, that the light from a candle will, will reach every corner of, of a room. And if you brought three candles into the room... If you brought three candles into the room, there would be only one light, yet three candles. How is that possible, he said. And John went on to say, if you can explain how there's only one light, yet three candles, then I'll explain to you the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Trinity. Even today, If you ask, what's the difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're likely to get either some blank, glassy-eyed stares, or you're going to get something like children might be taught in Sunday school, that the the Holy Trinity is is something like, well, it's, it's like water, right? It can be, it can exist in a gas, as steam, it can exist in, in a liquid form, it can exist as a solid, as ice. But, but it, all these forms, gas, liquid, or solid, it's still H2O, it's still water, right? Or, or, or maybe, maybe, you've heard, maybe you've heard it uh, explained like uh, being an egg. You know, there's the, there's the shell, there's the yolk, and there's the white. Or, or maybe, maybe you've had somebody uh, use the example, it's a, it's a three-leaf clover. You know, all of these, all of these are, are examples that I have heard uh, people try to use to explain that, particularly with children. You can probably think of some more. And, and, and all of these are, are, are efforts to explain uh, the one in three, three in one nature of God working in three distinct and yet interdependent ways. And, and, and I would say to you that while all of these efforts are well-intentioned and very sincere and, 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 and even noble, I would also say to you that all those efforts, because they're... We're not the first one to think about them. All of those ways of talking about the Trinity have been pretty much condemned by the early councils as being heretical. So, there you have it. We want to point to Scripture. And while it's true that this theological doctrine of the Trinity uh, is rooted in Scripture... The word Trinity is never found in the Bible. We get glimpses of the Trinitarian understanding of God in Scripture. We get get hints of this this holy mystery, but only in ways that protect that mystery. 
But still, still, we continue to try to demystify this triune nature of God. We try to demystify God. Still, we, we, we try and we fail. And every year, particularly on days like today, this day, we succumb to relying on weak analogies to define the Trinity. And I'll just say again, this whole Trinity thing uh, is very frustrating uh, for folks like me and uh, even for folk like you that take the time and effort uh, to wrestle with it. It's frustrating now. It has always been frustrating. We see a little bit of that in our reading today from John's Gospel. Jesus is, is talking with this Pharisee named Nicodemus. And Jesus in this conversation speaks of, of God being in heaven and loving the world and, and sending the Son unto the world. And, and Jesus speaks about the Spirit uh, that, that, uh, uh, that is through the Spirit whom, whom uh, believers are transformed. And, and through the Spirit, believers are born anew. And, and that the Spirit will, will blow where it will. And, and Nicodemus doesn't get it. If we read a little bit further on in John's gospel, along about in the 10th chapter, we'll read where, where Jesus proclaims that the Father and the Son are one. If we read a little bit further on in John's gospel, along about in the 14th chapter, We'll read about, Jesus talks about the gift of the Spirit. We shared a little bit with the children just a minute ago. Steve talked about this last week. And it's through the Spirit that all things will be made known to the disciples. But John goes on to say that everything uh, that belongs to the Father also belongs to the Son. And that the Son, that Jesus, will soon go to heaven to be with the Father. But, but they're not going to leave us alone. They're going, they, the Father and the Son, are going to send the Spirit to be with us. It's all very confusing stuff. It's so confusing and so frustrating that even the disciples complained, we don't understand. In, in his letter to the church at Rome, Paul uh, alludes to this divine relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. He, he, Paul speaks about things like living life in the Spirit and, and, the, and that we are going to be literally adopted as children of God. You and I, believers, will be adopted, literally adopted as children of God and the Spirit will bear witness in us and through us and the Spirit will give us the courage to call out for God, our creator, our father, and crying out as God's children helps us to discover that we are also joint heirs with Christ, heirs to the promise of reconciliation with the son, Jesus Christ, our savior, our brother. Paul uses that kind of language. That's in the eighth chapter, if you're curious, you want to go back to Rome, uh, to Romans and, and check that out. And that's, that's not, I mean, there, there's so many more. Even with all of these references in Scripture to the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, these, these glimpses of, of, of God's inner workings Still, just like Nicodemus, still just like the disciples, we don't fully understand the Trinity remains, always has been, a strange and a mysterious concept. And it occurs to me that maybe there's a reason for this. Maybe, maybe our efforts to scientifically prove or to systematically explain or to precisely articulate the Godhead misses the point entirely. Maybe God is not supposed to be easily explained. Maybe the way we need to talk about God or at least maybe the way we need to talk about the mystery of this triune God is to not 
attempt to demystify God. And you know why I say that? Because we can't demystify God. I cannot define for you how God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons all at the same time and still one God no matter how hard I try. And nobody else can either. You, you remember... You remember in Genesis, or not in Genesis, in, 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 in Exodus, in Exodus, about the third chapter, I believe, God is speaking to Moses. It's at the burning bush. Moses asked, who are you? Remember how God replies? I am who I am. Maybe, maybe all we can rightly say about God is that, that God will be who God will be. Now, that's pretty deep theology. And while I like that kind of stuff, most of you are not here to do deep theology. Most of you, uh, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I would imagine that a question comes to mind is, okay, preacher, so what? What does that mean for us? How does that impact? How does that, how does that influence? How does that, how does that shape the way that I live my everyday walking around life? And if you're asking that question, that's a great question. If you're not asking that question, you should be. There's a, there's a tribe of people in Southeast Africa, the, um, the Nguni people. And they have a word that they use frequently. That word is Ubuntu. And according to Bishop Desmond Tutu, Ubuntu means I am because we are. I am because I belong. A person is only really a person through other people. See, we are... We, as human beings, are made for togetherness. We are created for community. As human beings, my humanity is, is caught up in yours. My humanity is, is inextricably bound in your humanity. I need, we need other human beings in order to be human. I mean, none of us, none of us come into this world fully formed. We would not know how to walk or to talk or, or to think as human beings unless, unless we had other human beings who taught these things to us, we, unless we learned these things from other human beings. I can only be fully me if you are fully you. You are responsible for me. And I am responsible for you. My humanity is tied up in yours. A human or a person with Ubuntu a person with Ubuntu belongs as part of a greater whole. That's what Ubuntu is. It, it, is, it is a way of being human. It's a way of, of being human together 
and, and, and it, goes, it goes far beyond simply saying that we're all in this together. It, it, it means that we are all connect, connected at a very, very deep, deep, deep level. What if, what if the ultimate reality of, of the three natures of God, the triune nature of God, is wrapped up in something like Ubuntu? I mean, think about this. It, God is the creator, right? And, 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 and it is in God's nature to create. Without creation, God is not the creator. And if God is not the creator, then, then God loses part of whatever it is that makes God, God. And God is love. It's in God's nature to love. And any love that is not a, a narcissistic kind of love that needs something else, someone else, and other to love. So God needs creation to love. I'm not saying that, I'm not, I'm not going out in, in, in the waters, deep waters of heresy and saying that, that, that God can't be God without us, but, but, but God chooses to need us. God's identity is, is inextricably bound with ours, and, and our identity is bound with God's. And the hunger that, that we have for God, the, the desire that we have to know how, uh, that, we, that we have to know this God that, uh, that has created us, well, well what, if, what if that hunger, what if that desire reflects the hunger and the desire that God has for us? Because we say, we say that God desires a relationship with us, right? We, we make that claim. What, what if our identity is tied somehow to the identity of this God that loves us, that, that forever seeks after us, that, 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 that chases us, that pursues us, that, that wants to draw us together as children of the Holy Family? You see, we need God. And as strange as it sounds, God needs us. The relationship, this relationship gives divine meaning to the life of every single person in the world. Every person. Ubuntu is about relationships. God is about relationships. And all of Scripture speaks to the relational nature of God from the very, from the very first pages. In, in Genesis, the, the writer of Genesis uh, speaks about creation. And in the creation story, he talks about the relational nature of God. When he says, when God began to create, God said, let us, let us, let us create human beings in our image. It is relational language. And God breathed life into us. John and Paul both use relational language about God. God loves the world. We must be born of the Spirit. Those who live by the Spirit are adopted by the Father as children of God, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Relational language. God, Father, Son, and Spirit exist in relationship to each other, and we are invited to participate in that relationship. We are created for that. We are made in God's image. And if God the creator needs the other, needs us, if God needs creation to be most fully and completely God, then we need each other as well in order that we might become most fully who we are created to be. In creation, 
in, in, in the forgiveness of the cross, in, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God is revealed to all of creation. And all of creation experiences God and that relationship becomes complete. Folks, let that sink in a little bit. When we confess belief in a triune God, we are making the bold and radical claim that the God that we worship is neither static nor monolithic nor distant. When we confess a belief in the triune God, we are making the bold and radical claim that somehow the same God who created life out of nothingness also walk the earth in human form. We're claiming that the one who experienced crucifixion is the same one who at the exact same time experienced the death of a beloved child. When we, make, when we make a confession in the belief of the triune God, we are claiming that the one who ascended into heaven is the same one who will always be with us. We are claiming that the one who prays for us at the right hand of the Father is the same one groaning deep within our souls for the redemption of creation. When we say that we believe in a triune God, we are boldly claiming that the active God of the past is an on-the-move God of the present, acting now, and the, and the same God that will continue to act in the future until all things have been reconciled and made new. When we, when we confess a belief in the triune God, we are claiming that the God we worship and in whom alone we serve is a God for whom relationships are central. Relationship is at God's very core. We see the real essence of the Trinity rooted in relationship. God is Ubuntu. And if God is Ubuntu, if God is about mutually interdependent relationships, and if we are created in God's image, then we cannot simply exist on our own. We cannot exist isolated and autonomous. In order to really live out our identity as children of God, in order to live as, as a baptized people, we need, we are called, we, we are created to be in honest and deep relationships with each other as sisters and brothers in Christ. And not just within the, with the people within the walls of this building, but with everyone out there. We really must share one another's burdens. We must rejoice when one of us rejoices. We must weep when one of us weeps. And somehow, somehow, you and I have to figure out how to build and to nurture connection with each other and with everyone else so as not to lose out on who we've been created to be together. It's challenging. It's challenging, and I don't always like that challenge from God, but I believe that it's true. Somehow, in God's great imagination, somehow, in, and somehow in God's great humor, it is only when we are together, loving as Jesus loved, that we see the holy mystery with the clearest of eyes. When we are together serving others in the name of Christ. That is when we catch glimpses. When we are together, when we are Ubuntu, that is when we are living out our identity as people beautifully and lovingly created 
in the image of God. That's when we experience most fully the relationship that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This, this is the Trinity. This is how we are meant to be today. This is how we are meant to be every day. And it is good news for us and for all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Loving God, we don't fully understand. We wrestle with the limitations of our language. And yet you continue to come to us to reveal yourself to us in ways that are transformative, that are full of love, that are full of grace and mercy. You reveal yourself to us in ways that are challenging, always inviting us, always calling us to be who you've created us to be in community with each other and you. Forgive us when we fail. Forgive us when we do not live into that calling. Help us in our weakness, O oh God. This is our prayer. We offer it to you in the name of the one who draws all things to himself, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you will please stand and join me in singing our hymn of response, Open My Eyes That I May See.
You may be seated. As we begin, uh, if we extend the invitation to our ushers to come forward, uh, I would simply say to you uh, that one of the ways that we participate in God's kingdom and God's holy work is in the sharing of our resources, our lives, our time, our talents, and and our, our monetary gifts. In the United Methodist Church, we pool money together, congregations, to do more than any one church could do on its own. So when you give, you are joining with sisters and brothers everywhere to make a serious, a serious impact in people's lives, to, to, to make a serious uh, work done in kingdom building in this place, in this community, and also around the world. So we thank you for being so generous in your giving. Loving God, pour your spirit out. Free us to know the joy of being in ministry with you. To know the joy of generosity. Open our eyes that we may see what you're doing. Open our ears that we may hear stories of the way that you're changing lives. Use our feet and our hands and our gifts to your glory. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
remain standing. Let us affirm our faith. Oh, there we go. Now then, let us remain standing. Let us affirm our faith together as we recite the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You will remain standing for our song of sending forth our God is great.
job. Wow, we are so happy that you're here. And I just have to say, yeah. I, I don't even have words. That was great. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Quinn leading the way. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. Talking about Quinn, it's a birthday party today, this afternoon. All right. So, uh, Quinn's birthday. Do we have others? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. All right. So, we're going to sing because not all of us are going to be able to be at the birthday party. So, we're going to sing happy birthday to Quinn. All right. She's going to be spoiled, I'm sure. I'm sure. Next week, Father's Day. Don't forget. Right, I got to, got to stick up for the dads here, right? All right. All right. We're, we're, going, we're, going, to, we're going to recognize dads uh, here at worship next week as well. Um, but uh, So they'll, they'll be, you'll want to be here for a little something, something for, for dads. Um, on not next week, but the following Sunday, June the 26th, uh, we're going to have our first, you know, we, we, we've been talking a little bit uh, about all the stuff going on in the United Methodist Church and the, and the turmoil and the confusion, and it's still tumultuous and it's still confusing, but we're going to have uh, an opportunity um, on uh, June 26th, uh, that Sunday afternoon, we're going to gather. Some, you'll have an opportunity to gather. We'll do our first session of uh, these kind of table talks about what's going on in the United Methodist Church uh, and, and what our future is and all that. It's not going to be the only time. If you can't make it on Sunday, the 26th, there will be other dates, other uh, opportunities to get together. I'm going to probably announce uh, three or four more uh, opportunities to gather together. And we'll present some information. You'll have all the time in the world to ask whatever questions you need to ask. And... Um, and, and we'll answer those questions for you. Uh, but I want to go ahead and let you know that we're planning on our first, uh, our first date for our uh, Methodist Table Talks on June the 26th. We'll be getting a specific time out to you a little bit later. It's been so good to see you here. I want to invite you to come back next week. I know you will. And not just for Father's Day. We're going to gather up here. We're going to worship. When you come next week, bring somebody with you. And now receive this blessing. You are people of God. Adopted into the Holy Family. Co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Loved by God the Father. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let that define you. Let that live in you and through you. Share that with others. Use words if you have to. Amen. Amen. Amen.